Good morning. Welcome back to the Outreach of the Heart Ministries this morning. I'm running a little bit behind, um, <clears throat> but all is well. Good to be here. Glad you're here. What a message we have this morning. You know, last week I took the weekend off. That was the first time in I don't know how many years that I've actually taken a Sunday off, um, not giving a, a message. It felt a little strange, but I tell you what, I'm rejuvenated. I, I I just feel even more enthusiastic this morning as I come before you to share this message with you. I'm coming to you live from Sydney, Montana. I rolled in here late last night, um, spent several hours last night updating a computer or I had to buy a new computer to do my research on. It had failed me earlier in the week. So that's part of why I'm a little bit behind behind schedule here this morning. But you know what? It's all in God's time. Not our time. It's in God's time. It gave each of you an opportunity to search and to find this message this morning. But what we're going to be talking about this morning is this question. This question, and here it is. Are you ready for this? Are you truly ready to be able to give an answer to this question? Well, what's the question? What's the question? Why do I follow Jesus? Why do I follow Jesus? That is the question of this day. And that's <clears throat> hopefully as we go through this, this message this morning, you're going to have to give it an account of yourself before God. This, Lord, is why I follow you. So as usual, this is going to cause us to dig deep within, to evaluate ourselves, to look inward, not outward. Don't compare ourselves to other people, but only to look deep within us and allow God to reveal to us maybe some, some of our shortcomings, some of our strengths, some of our weaknesses, some of how he's working in our life. So we're going to answer this question. I can't give an answer for you, but I'm going to give you some examples from God's word as to why we may follow him. Why is this such a big question? Well, that question arises because of some of the people that I get a chance to meet. Being out here on the road, some of the people that I get a chance to meet. Here a while back, I met a, a man from India who is of the Sikh, S-I-C-H, religion. The Sikh religion. Met a man the other day who is of no religion at all. He says he is a righteous man, or he is a, I shouldn't say righteous man, he is a religious man, but he doesn't follow any particular religion. So to be for, in the forefront here, there are multiple different religions around the world. Multiple different religions around the world. So I'm asking you, why do you, why do you follow Jesus? But before we dive any deeper, and as you think about that question, let us join in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this message. I thank you for the scriptures that you allowed to just flow this morning as you prepared this message for this moment, for this time. Lord, we love you. We thank you. 
And we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Lord, this is not about me. This is not about us. As we go through this life, Lord, may we, may we not seek attention for ourselves. But rather to give you all the recognition. To give you the glory and the honor. To say, I worship you, Lord. I follow you. And this is why. And here is the evidence thereof. So, Lord, I just ask your blessings upon this message. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, <clears throat> if you will turn with me to the book of Galatians. If you're wondering where Galatians is, well, you can start in the New Testament. You can go through the four Gospels, and then you hit Acts, and then you hit Romans. After Romans is 1 Corinthians, then 2 Corinthians. Then that leads us to Galatians. Or if you know where Ephesians is, Galatians is the book just prior to the book of Galatians, or Galatians is the book just prior to Ephesians, excuse me. So Galatians chapter 1, verses 3, 4, and 5. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present age, present age evil age, it says, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now let me read that to you again. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this, the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to him, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What does that have to do with following Jesus? Answering this question, why do I follow Jesus? Well, we're going to break this down. I want you to, to hear these highlighted words as I read this scripture once again. Grace. And peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. So we're going to be looking at these key words here in this scripture of grace, peace, gave, sins, rescue, will, and glory. Now, if you, I'm going to give you just a moment to jot all of those down. And then we're going to look at particular scriptures according to each of them. So we're going to start with grace. And we're going to move into peace. Gave. Then sins. Then rescue followed by will, and ending with glory. So let me read this scripture to you again. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Grace. What What is a, a typical scripture that we would use for grace well we can turn to ephesians the the very next book ephesians 2 8 9 which says plain and simple this is the foundation of our salvation for it is by grace you have been saved through faith this is not of yourselves it is a gift of god not by works lest any man should boast 
Why do I follow Jesus? Because he gave of himself for me. God's grace, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Your salvation comes only through God's grace. And we can only accept God's grace through faith. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not by works, lest any man should boast. So if you are a part of a religion that tells you that you must do something in order to inherit your salvation, do something other than accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Don't get me wrong. We do have to do something. We have to accept. But if we're going out, if we're being taught that we have to go out and do works, Works such as you're not saved unless you are baptized by immersion in water. No, we are saved by the baptism of the Holy Spirit when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Our water baptism is just an outward expression of an inward relationship with Jesus. That's all it is. If you're being taught that you must obey this teaching or that teaching or this other teaching or, or anything other than what Scripture says when Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you're trying to get to heaven through any other will of your own or acts of your own without going through Jesus Christ, you will never arrive in heaven. So these other religions around the world, they focus on a God or a higher power. As this, this gentleman told me, I believe in a higher power. I believe I am a religious person, I believe there is a higher power, but who is that higher power? Is it God, the creator of the heavens and the earth? Is it Jesus Christ, his son, who died on a crucifixion cross to save us? Who paid the ultimate penalty for the wages of sin is death, and Jesus took upon that wage? He paid the debt that we could never pay. Grace. Grace is our, the fundamental aspect of our salvation. Without God's grace, we would have nothing. Without God's grace, he would not have sent his son to die on a crucifixion cross. But God's desire to be with his creation is so intense. He wants to be with you. He wants to be with me for eternity. And he's given us his grace. He's given us that opportunity to be with him. If we do not accept his grace, what is the alternative? We will spend an eternity in a place called hell. That God himself also created for Satan and his followers. Well, I'm not a follower of Satan. Well, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, my friends, you're a follower of Satan, a follower of this world. There's no gray matter in this. We can't sit on the fence and say, well, I'm a part of the world, but I also follow Jesus. You either follow Jesus and walk the narrow road with him. Or you walk on the highway that leads to hell. There is no middle ground. We cannot be lukewarm. Because God will spit us out of his mouth. We need to be on fire for the Lord. 
We need to be on fire for the Lord. Are you on fire for the Lord? Well, let's ask that question again. Why do I follow Jesus? Because I want to be on fire. No, let's truthfully answer that question. Why do I follow Jesus? Many will say, I follow Jesus because I don't want to go to hell. They're not interested in a, a deep personal relationship with Jesus. They're using it, uh, Jesus as an escape route from hell. They've heard about hell. They've heard about the torment for eternity. So the alternative there is, well, I'm going to follow Jesus instead because that's my ticket away from hell. It's not how it works, folks. When we follow Jesus, we make a commitment to him. We make a commitment to him to accept his grace. It's as simple as that. It's as black and white as that. Have you accepted his gift of grace, which is his son and his salvation? Well, let's go a little bit deeper into this. Turn to Titus. Titus, way back towards the back of the Bible. Titus, it's a little bitty book. A little bitty book that I am overlooking at the moment. Titus. There it is. It's after 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us. Now, grace, what does it do? It offers us salvation, but it also teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearance of the, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. Eager to do what is good. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Grace. Grace. I thought grace was just a gift. No, grace continues to work in our life. God's grace continues to work in our life. And it teaches us in verse 12 to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. But I thought, I thought grace was just God's riches at Christ's expense. Well, one of God's riches is teaching us. Teaching us to say no. Teaching us to live self-controlled, godly lives. Do you focus on living in such a way as to please God in all your thoughts, all your actions, all of your words. That's difficult to do. Because we get in the way. But God's grace is continually at work in us. Who follow Jesus. To teach us. How to live a life. That is pleasing to God. How to obey his will how to obey his teachings, how to understand the scriptures that he has given us. There's so much more to grace, but we're going to move on to this word peace. Peace. We turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, 
rejoice. Now, I, I pause there for just a moment. And as you're following Jesus, what kind of rejoicing do you do? You know, I remember back in, in some of the older days, and some of you may, may well remember this, there was a particular um, denomination, if you will, that that was taught that to be a humble servant of the Lord, to be a Christian meant that you had to not participate in such things. For example, you couldn't go to a dance. You couldn't play cards. You couldn't do this. You couldn't do this. You couldn't do that. I don't find anywhere in Scripture where it says we can't do this. But Scripture, in fact, tells us that we live within this world, but we're not a part of this world. Okay? We're separated from this world as followers of Jesus. So we we still attend these events, but we are not engulfed by these events. We're not transformed back into the world by attending or participating in these events. Well, what was also taught by this group of, of believers was that you had to be a solemn worshiper of Christ. Oh, to sing and to dance? in a worship service, to let the Holy Spirit move within you during worship, to put a smile on your face, to let the glory of God be known. No, they were taught to act more like the, the, uh, the Pharisees of the days of old. Walk around with their heads hung low. Oh, it is a burden to live for Christ. It is a burden upon me to follow Jesus. No, it is not a burden. It is an opportunity to follow Jesus. It is an opportunity to follow Jesus. Well, Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again. Rejoice, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayers and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we've got God's grace continually working in us to teach us how to live a godly life, how to please him in all that we do, all that we say, all that we think. It's continually, God's grace is continually transforming us into the image of Christ. That's why we call ourselves Christians. The grace is continually transforming us. When we understand God's grace more and more and more. And then God throws in his peace, which transcends all understanding. And it does what for us? It guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So we don't need to walk around as followers of Jesus with our head hung low and a solemn face. We need to rejoice. We need to rejoice. And again, I say it, rejoice. Rejoice in your relationship with Jesus. Rejoice in walking with the Lord. Rejoice in knowing where your salvation truly comes from. Rejoice in the knowing that it is by grace you have been saved, not by works. Rejoice in the knowledge that it is by faith and grace that you receive your inheritance into heaven. A peace which transcends all understanding. We cannot fathom God's ultimate grace. We cannot grasp even 
the minuteness of God's grace and how it continues to work in us, how it has been offered to us, and what it means to truly accept it. But when we, we try to understand that, when we let God's grace work in us, the peace that comes upon us is so intensified. It is so undeniable. It is so inexplainable because it transcends all understanding. Well, through this teaching, we also understand that God gave. Well, we read John 3, 16, 17, and 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that, so that God gave, and the result is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that anyone, anyone, not just the ones, as, as we read through scripture, the ones who are called, the ones... God has chosen. No, this was offered to all. God has called particular individuals into doing more for him. Let's look at Saul, who became Paul, for an example. Saul was a persecutor of Christians, but God chose him to be one of the most influential individuals in all of God's determination to get his word out. Let's, I don't know how else to word this, how else to word that. But God chose Saul and he became Paul. And one of the most influential teachers of God's word. How has God called you? First, he gave you the opportunity to accept his son. For God so loved the world, in other words, you and me, that he gave his only begotten son, so that anyone who shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, verse 17 and 18, which are so crucial to verse 16, but so often left separated from this. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So we have grace. We have peace. And we've got this fact that God has given his son to save us. Not to condemn us, but to save us. Now we look at this next word, sins. Why does God need to save us? What is he saving us from? We turn to the book of Daniel. Daniel, this is not where I'm sure you expect it to go when we talk about sin. But Daniel, we turn to the book of Daniel. We turn to the book of Daniel. And we're looking at chapter nine. Daniel chapter nine, beginning in verse four. This is a prayer that Daniel says to the Lord. Now, I'm not going to read the entire prayer, but I'm going to read the first several verses of this. Verses 4 through 14. Daniel says, I prayed to the Lord, my God, and confessed. Here's his prayer. Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. 
We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all of Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you, we and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiven, forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the word spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing, us, bringing on us great disasters. Under the whole heaven, nothing has been done like this, like what has happened has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in verse 13, in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. Now verse 14, the Lord did not hesitate to bring disaster, bring this disaster upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him folks that is one of the best set of scripture to help me to understand my disobedience my sin and why God sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for my sin we have rebelled we have disobeyed his laws. We have turned away from God. And our nation as a whole, as our world as a whole, continues to turn from the living God. Continues to turn from grace. From God's amazing grace continues to lose that peace that transcends all understanding. Continues to walk away from what God has given us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And through all of that walking away, all of that turning away, the world returns to sin. You see, if we're not following Jesus, we're following the ways of this world. And the ways of this world are sin. The ways of the world are sin. Now, how can you say that, Stace? Because who, who is the ruler of the world? God gave him dominion over the world. Under his authority. Satan can only do so much but he's turned him loose. Satan is the author and perfecter of sin. Disobeying God is sin. And we could go down through a list of sins, a multitude of sins. But what it boils down to, sin is disobeying God. Disobeying his commands. Doing what is contrary to who God is. Doing the opposite of who he is. That is sin. That is sin. But God is going to rescue us. He has rescued us. And we look at Second Peter chapter 2. 
2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, along with seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them as an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Verse 9, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue. He knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the uprighteous or the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. God has a rescue plan. God has a life preserver. God sent his only begotten son to save us from our sin and to rescue us from the darkness of this, this world. Do you follow Jesus because he is your rescuer? Do you follow Jesus because he is your savior, the one who saved you? Do you follow Jesus again just to escape hell? It's the better alternative. Why do you follow Jesus? Ask yourself this question. Why do I follow Jesus? Well, we go on a little bit further. Colossians. Colossians. Chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. We haven't mentioned the Holy Spirit yet. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son that He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Isn't this an incredible set of Scripture, once again, that God reveals to us? Now we look at this word, will. Not my will, but your will be done, as Jesus prayed in the garden. As we follow Jesus, do we ask him for his will to be done? Or do we just want our will? Well, we look in Romans. Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
Now, many Christians or followers of Jesus say, I don't know what God's will for my life is. What is God's will for your life? That you give Him glory. That you accept His grace. That you live in the peace that transcends all understanding. That you accept that He gave to you His Son to pay the penalty of your sins. And that He is rescuing you from this dark, dark world and bringing you into His light, into His kingdom. That is God's will for each and every one of us. But state, that doesn't ask or my, answer my question. What is God's will for my life? What am I supposed to be doing? He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God's will is that your mind be renewed. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By reading the scripture, by hearing messages such as this, we are transformed. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. What is God's will? Let's go back a little bit further into verse 1. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. How many of us have made a commitment to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God? How many of us have committed to worshiping God every day of the week, not just on our day that we call the Sabbath, whatever day that may be for you. Do you focus on living for Christ? Do you focus on living out the example Christ set forth for you in his life here on this earth? Why do I follow Jesus? It's hard to follow Jesus. I stand out in a crowd when I follow Jesus. Well, amen to that. Why do you stand out in a crowd? Because you're the light in the midst of the darkness. That darkness from which you've been rescued. Yeah, but people make fun of me. Is that really God's will? Look at what they did to Jesus. Look at what they did to Jesus. Look at what they did to all of the apostles. Look at what happened to Paul. Look at what happened to Peter. Look at what has happened to some of those of our modern age who have followed Jesus. They have followed him to death through persecution. Why do I follow Jesus? Well, we've got one more word to look at, and that's the word glory. We turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, Verse 21, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him.
through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What? I don't understand. Let's read that again. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep. Now, before we read verse 21, let's go back and pick up the beginning of verse 20. Now may the God of peace, now verse 21, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. May he work in us. May he carry out his will in us and through us. That is why I follow Jesus, or one of the reasons I follow Jesus, is so that others can come to the saving knowledge of who he is. So that I can spend eternity with others in heaven. Because I was willing to do God's will, to allow him to work through my life, to share the salvation story, to share the gospel, to share the love of Jesus Christ with people that I come in contact with. There are no chance encounters. They are all divine appointments. Why are you following Jesus? Why do you follow Jesus? Well, we turn to the book of Acts, but before we turn there, I want to go back and read Galatians 1, 3 through 5, that we've been focusing on. Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. We didn't talk about the present evil age, but I think we know what that is according to the will of God our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I read it again. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And we close this morning out of the book of Acts. Out of the book of Acts, chapter 20. Acts, chapter 20. We go down to verse 32. And I say this with sincerity of my heart. Acts 20, verse 32. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. May God Receive the glory. Let us praise. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this place. Thank you for your word. Your word. Your abundance. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the peace that transcends all understanding. Thank you for giving your son on our behalf. Thank you for our allowing the blood of Jesus to wash away our sin, to serve as the atoning sacrifice, the propitiation of our sin. Thank you, Lord, for rescuing us from the darkness of this evil world and of this present age. Thank you for your will, your will that continues to work in the lives in the lives of those who follow you. 
And thank you for your glory, Lord. Your glory which shines through in the midst of these desperate times. It gives us hope, Lord. When your word says that the heavens declare the glory, your glory, when we look and we see your mighty hand in the sunrise, in the sunset, in the storms of life, we see your glory, Lord. We find peace. We find that peace. And we let your grace continually to teach us and to give us more and more knowledge of who you truly are. So, Lord, as I answer this question, why do I follow Jesus Christ? Why do I follow Jesus? My answer to you, Lord, and to those whom will hear, I follow Jesus because there is no other way to you but through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he is my life. He is my life giver. He is my life saver. He is. He is. Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.